Welcome to the Can I Decoded show. Today I have Paul. Paul, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name. Uh, my last name is Deshaun. I, uh, I go by Paul Edward most of the time because it's a lot easier to say. So you can find me uh, on either name. So I'm super excited having you today on, on the show. And we will cover some topics that uh, may or may not be controversial, but we're here to kind of clean up some misconceptions around certain types of dogs. In my last episode, I already talked about shelter dogs. I'm going to dive a little bit more deeper into this um, when it comes to bully breeds, maybe pits because of your experience. Um, and then we'll see where it takes us in terms of topics that might be controversial if you feel like it to, to uncover some myths and debunk some myths. Certainly. But before we dive into it, for everyone who um, hasn't heard of Paul Edward yet, <laughs> Why don't you give you me a, a very, very short introduction about your life, whatever you want to share, and how you came to work with, with dogs? Okay. Um, so I currently have a dog training business in Massachusetts. Um, I am a competitor in a few different protection sports. Um, have a, a fondness for the Malinois, of, of which I have a handful living in my house at the time. Um, how many? Uh, three. Okay. Are there plans to get more? Uh, that that's a fluid number. Yeah. <laughs> Very dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I sometimes I'll have like uh you know last year I raised a dog for somebody else. I'll occasionally have friends um help me start projects or I'll start help them start projects rather. Um, so that happens from time to time. Um, you know, so it's kind of a it's an it's an ever changing thing. Um. I got my start in dogs in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, and this is where like I'll get into uh, how I got started with the pit bull stuff. Um, I was in my early 20s living in Boston with my friends. Um, we were a bunch of punk rock kids, street mm -hmm. kids, just living in these like crammed houses uh, full of people in not the best neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and there was always pit bulls around. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them were strays. Some of them were dogs that were being fought by neighborhood kids. Um, There's a lot of dog fighting going on in that time in that area. Um, so we would end up kind of crossing paths with these dogs and end up taking them in. Um, kind of like at the same time, a lot of this centered around being involved in the music scene and things like that. So we'd be like traveling around the country, living in vans, uh, crashing at these houses in different cities. Um, and there was always like, it seemed to be like some mascot pit bull around. Mm. Um, before the uh, pit bull rescue kind of became this popular cause and this virtuous thing, it was kind of like a, a counterculture thing where you would just kind of, they would just kind of be around with, with people from kind of like the underground culture. Um, At this point, when you started to get in touch more with dogs, mm -hmm. did you have, well, did you, did you, did you know anything about dogs or was it just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I came to learn. Um, and it, it was funny too. So like, I, I tell people like the way that I came into this was, was like super backwards and it's kind of come full circle, you know? Um, so it's like, we would, we would get a hold of these dogs and that like, I have wild stories. Like some of them I won't tell, like some of the dogs that came from dog fighting situations, like um, there was like some vigilante rescue stuff that kind of went on back then, um, yeah. you know, like, stuff that needed to happen dogs that were like in, in really bad shape so like you know a lot of times like we would we would have these dogs um take dogs in or you know just find a dog on the street or something like that and you know it was a great idea and then you get them home and it's like well, what do we do now <laughs> and a lot of this is again this is like the late 90s early 2000s so the internet was in its infancy then so there was mm -hmm. a ton of information so we'd go to the bookstore or go to the library and just grab a book, you know. Oh my gosh! <laughs> um, so the old, time, yeah. So like at the, that you could find about about pit bulls. Um, I always encourage people to educate themselves and read up on this stuff, even though it's it's barbaric. Um, it's a series of books by a guy called Richard Stratton, um, and they're essentially a, accounts of dog fighting. Not cool, you know what I mean? It's it's like barbaric, it's horrifying, but but again, like generation after generation after generation of what these dogs were bred to do, I think understanding um, what it is that drives them is something that people need to understand. So 
we would get these books and there would be, you know, all this like graphic horrific stuff, but then there'd be pictures of dogs like hanging from spring poles and playing tug. And we would kind of like be figuring that out as we went, like, well, they like to tug on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it was clear that they had this drive, this like biological imperative to like do this yeah. sort of behavior. Um, so we would kind of like learn to play tug with dogs. And I, I'm sure like at the same time, there was sport dog trainers all over the country that were starting to use play as a, a reinforcer and as a motivator and things like that. But we kind of just found that out on our own kind of organically. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple of training books that I looked into back then. Um, the ones that were popular at the time were like the, um, the, the monks, the, yeah. The, yeah. Those, that, those books were, were kind of popular then. Um, yeah, not not too many others. So like the training was, was kind of minimal. As I got a little bit older um, and started to kind of settle down in my life, I wanted to get more interested in training. And um, so I started working with some different trainers and stuff like that. And that's kind of what turned me on to the Malinois. And I met the Malinois and I'm kind of, oh, you're kind of like the pit bull of the herding breed. So it kind of <laughs> pushed me in that direction. Yeah. Play first before you learn about how to train a dog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And would you say, isn't that for anyone who kind of gets a dog, adopts a dog, would that be the right sequence? Because I'm asking because a lot of times when we get dogs, the first thing we think we have to train, we have mm -hmm. to train to sit down, we go to obedience classes before anything else, because that's the first thing. I have a truck, I have to train the dog. Yeah. Is this, are we missing like the first step of actually what you did in the way getting to know the dog and play with the dog? In my opinion, that that's how I always come at dogs. Um, You know, when we have clients, it gets difficult because of um, time frames and expectations. And like, that's a, a challenge I've always found in the training business is to sell people on that. You know, they're like where I tell them, I'm like, you know, the first six times you come see me, like, we're just going to get this dog to open up and play. And they, oh, well, they, you know, the boot camp down the street will do, have the dog off leash trained in two weeks. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and to, to your question, like those dogs, those, those pit bulls that we had back then, were kind of like, I'm not going to say they didn't need training, but like you kind of find out in this organic way that like when you connect with them on that level, everything is just so much easier. You know, um, that's the way I, I kind of come at my dogs now. Like we see like with the internet and everything, um, you know, I was, I'm borrowing this from Ivan, but he used to say that everybody wants to be the champion of YouTube. <laughs> mm -hmm. like have the puppy that's like the the coolest puppy on instagram and stuff like that and when i get dogs um for myself all, all i do is, is play with them like that's all i want to do is build obsession um with the game and from there it's like when i do have to introduce training um everything goes so quick because we know the way that play kind of facilitates learning And then I have such a captive audience at that point with the dog that it just makes everything so easy. Like I joke with people all the time. It's like, I don't, I mean, like maybe I'll teach like a finished recall for competition, but it's like for my competition dog, it's like, I don't need to teach. It's like, I'm just cool to be around. Like I've been cool yeah. to be around since you've been eight weeks old. You know. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's kind of how I approach it. Like I had a dog that was here for a personal protection client. She was here um, for a year um, from eight weeks old till she was a year old. And, um, Like I joke with people all the time. It's like the first nine months of that dog's life, all she did was play. That's all we did, you know? And then all the obedience that she needed to go to her home. And it's like, we just do that at the end. Like she just needed to play. There's nine months of play and then well, three months, a little bit of, of training. <laughs> I joke with my, my current competition dog now. Um, we started, you know, the what she's bred to do and the sport that she's kind of bred for is it's like a, a kind of like a fast track sort of program with the ring sport stuff. So like I joke that, When she was like five months old, I, she was asking me questions. So we, <laughs> we started doing some work, you know, like we started working on a lot of behavior. She was asking me questions at that point. I like that. I like yeah. that. It's like, why is that? And why do we do this? And then why that? But and the way they do, right? If you actually really look at it, they do do that. You just got to yeah. be able to read it. That's like the first thing that I like to do. I mean, like we see all these videos of uh, people on the internet, like doing these little like hand lore focus heels and stuff like that with little tiny puppies and it's like that's always my first thing is like eight weeks old it's like show me a dog that at eight weeks old brings a ball back and spits it at your feet and makes eye contact with you like that's like far more impressive to me and yeah that's far more what i'm going for with the dogs yeah. on the train. 
So when you go back to like your, your initial contact with dogs, when you kind of got more into this and you worked more with them, mm -hmm. everyone else has some different motivations or feels connected. Everyone who loves dogs and trains dogs and really is committed to this has different motivations. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, my, my last guest was kind of like healing from trauma in the yeah. same fashion, yeah, yeah. same way. For others, it's just, you know, for, for me, for example, it's like, I know I'm I'm rather introvert than extrovert. A lot of social settings with people um, in group setting really exhausting to me. And with dogs, you know, I really don't. And and I like if I don't have to care about anything <laughs> other than you know what you do in this moment, like the flow state. And you don't really have this often with with today's society and, and uh, the busy world. So what was it? What was it for you? So initially, going back to the the pit bull thing, it was kind of like this, you know romantic serendipitous type of thing where like at that time in my life and the people that I was hanging around and my friends it was like we kind of had these you know kind of outcast people that kind of found comfort with these outcast dogs you know what I mean there was kind of like this shared empathetic sentiment of like I am what you made me um with the pit bull you know what I mean and it's like for all the things that they possess that are great like that loyalty and that tenacity and that never quit attitude um albeit kind of misplaced through the direction of, of human influence when people started breeding them for dog fighting and things like that um that kind of misunderstood thing was a, a a big draw with that and then um as i continued on with it um kind of like what you just shared about yourself is um you know i i i am kind of like an introverted person so i i do like to kind of just um you know, I'd rather connect with a dog than people a lot of the time. Um, so that's kind of like my, my motivation. I think, um, you know, animals, even dangerous ones, even ones with really severe behavior problems, um, are very pure. So it's kind of like a lot of my, my motivation. And, and like you, you mentioned already the, the outcast kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So when you, and, and the, the dogs that you, you're working with right now they are they are not on the on the stronger end of things melanoids and in particular that, mm -hmm. that you find your passion for you will find people especially when it comes to pits and it goes now into this um let's talk about the misconceptions or maybe they're not misconceptions um about pit bulls because on one hand you will find people who just love this breed yeah. and they're the cutest dog and they're the most loyal dogs and you know obviously that doesn't have to be wrong it's true Mm -hmm. But then you also find people who say these are really dangerous and it's not responsible to get a dog like that, whether this is a shelter dog, a pit from a shelter dog, or actually a puppy that you raise. And then you have, of course, politics who try to ban that breed. So let's try to untangle this a little bit. Yeah. Because you just said when they started breeding the dog for dog fights, mm -hmm. that kind of implies that there is already some some genetics that make yeah. this dog more suitable for this kind of action. So let's talk about this in terms of, is this dog inherently dangerous? So the, the thing that makes that this conversation tricky, and, and this is what, um, you know, it's, it's probably the most overbred dog breed on the planet. Like I, I, I'd need to find a statistic, but, but probably. And it's definitely at this point, um, the most diluted uh, gene pool. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so the, the, the term pit bull, and then the sort of things that they get uh, attached to, the sort of behaviors they get attached to, the sort of um, activities that they get attached to, um, are fairly subjective. You know, to me, they all kind of come from the same place. We can go back generations, but there's just different different breedings and then different circumstances that lead to different outcomes. So it's like, um, you know, the people who are involved in dog fighting. And, and again, like, I, I can't say this enough that like, I, I don't want to glorify any of this. This is barbaric. It's, it's inhumane, but it's stuff that people need to understand because like, as you just said, that there's a genetic component to all of this. Um, the biggest misconception is, and like we know now, but you hear people, it's all how you raise them. It's like, well, no, like, <laughs> you know, they have certain things they've been bred to do for a really long time. So that's not, always the case and there's a lot that we can do with the environment to to change things but there are certain things that come out that are there that are you know pretty seriously you know in, in their dna so if we look back um the earlier part of the 1900s when dog fighting you know kind of was popular in america it was happening in, in rural communities um 
as barbaric and terrible as it was, you have a kind of like a culture of people that because it was attached to farming and kind of like the rural community, like there are people who kind of had an understanding of animal husbandry and they had an understanding of breeding and they had an understanding of genetics. Um, those dogs that they used to fight in those cases, to me, that aggression was coming from like a really specific place. Um, you know, there's a couple different categories that I'll put that in. It's like, we'll see dogs um, back then or from those bloodlines that will fight purely out of that kind of like dominance aggression where it's just you're in my physical space so i need to just get you out like that it is what it is um there are other dogs that kind of in the in the fight or flight context are, are kind of missing flight and they just automatically go to conflict and they'll stay there and then there's other dogs that i see in those older the older bloodlines and stuff like that where i think it's far more common is that aggression actually comes from prey drive so strong that it will be you know directed on a member of its own species with no regard for self-preservation whatsoever i see that to me with those older bloodlines and stuff like that that's real common so this is a far stretch from the dog that's been backyard bred again and again and again that maybe loses some of those qualities, but some city kid ties it up to a fence and throws rocks at it and hits it with sticks to make it mean. Those older dogs, like that that whole idea of, oh, they were the nanny dog and they're great with kids and this stuff, like that's kind of nonsense. I mean, typically we didn't see as much human aggression with those dogs. I mean, I wasn't alive back then, but from what I understand and the reading that I've done and then seeing dogs from those bloodlines that are still around today, um, less and less human aggression um and again this comes to understanding dog fighting you know what i mean they had to be handled by human beings uh in the middle of that chaotic situation um what they would do in dog fights is is there would sometimes be problems where they would have people that would put some kind of a poison on their dog's coat so that when the other dog bit them they would get sick and things like that so it started a, a kind of customary thing where you would hand your dog to the opposing team and they would go wash them to make sure that you didn't do any sneaky stuff. So we have these dogs that are like getting ready to go into this totally heated situation. They get handed off to a person they don't know. So like the dog aggression, yeah, that's there. Um, back then in those bloodlines, you see kind of less and less human aggression. Some of the dogs that I rescued that had come from like really serious backwoods dog fighting operations um, who would freight train another dog were fine with like a lot of people, fine with kids. Also, like a lot of these dogs, because they're built for that situation, have kind of a high threshold to pain, high threshold to, you know, environmental stress and things like that. So that's a, a whole different thing. Um, you know, years later, when they kind of became like a status symbol in like urban culture and things like that, we'd have people that wanted to promote human aggression with the breed. Um, and a lot of that, you know was made possible by bad breeding and then people just abusing dogs to kind of, you know, make them mean or, or, or whatever. Um, so again, it, the, the, just the different varying forms of aggression and varying temperaments at, at this point, it's, it's all over the place. So it's really hard to nail down, um, you know, like what a specific picture of that looks like, you know? Yeah. And, and for just to follow up, because the way I usually kind of see human aggression versus dog aggression, for example, kind of drawing examples from the wild, you know, it's conspecific aggression. So for example, a wolf attacking another wolf, right, is is can happen in various scenarios, territorial aggression, right, kind of like uh, whatever fight over food, but then there's the predatory aggression that kind of is not conspecific, but means, you know, obviously hunting, for example, mm -hmm. prey drive kicking in. Um, that I, I believe, like you said, this kind of prey aggression or predatory aggression in nowadays can can be conspecific between dogs. Um, I think one of the reasons is you have so many different shapes of dogs that sometimes it's even hard for a dog to understand mm -hmm. that this is another dog, especially from a distance. Um, but when it comes to human aggression, I haven't really figured it out yet in my head how I want to 100% phrase it, but I have a hard time, um, you know, when we talk about um, this real dominance aggression that goes towards humans. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are d dogs that are definitely more dominant or more leaning into the conflict, um, but 
per se. I do think that when it comes to human aggression, there must be a really big factor that has to do with handling and um, not necessarily all the way to abuse. It doesn't have to be an abuse dog to feel ag like aggressive towards humans, but still handling in the way that is, makes dog uncomfortable and then leans into the conflict and then leans into human aggression. But I would argue that maybe per se, it's almost unlikely that the dog just per se is aggressive towards a human if there's always a good interaction. Yeah. Do you agree with this or do you think there's also a natural human aggression happening? Possibly? No, I, I think it's I think it's much more rare than people um, boil it down to. You know what I mean? Like just that that actual dominance aggression directed at a human being is um, that, that's super rare. And I think it gets confused with. Um, yeah. You know, like like you just said, like there's usually some something that precedes what we perceive as that. Like, but just having that be like an inherent thing is um very, very rare. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think it's a lot more this all the handling frustration that gets redirected. Mm -hmm. Um, so the nuances actually really matter here. Yeah. Um so now we're talking about pits and 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 maybe then also Malinors, but what is it what would you say? Is there anything in particular other than that? Pits, for example, have been bred to engage in dog fights. Mm -hmm. But what does it really mean? Does it really mean that we dialed up the aggression? Did it mean that we dialed up the or lowered the pain perception so they hold on longer? Like, what did we actually manipulate? I'm asking this because did we just, did we actually create, quote unquote, a monster? Or did we just like have a dog that just holds on longer, but kind of the qualities you can find in a lot of different breeds as well? So, so like when they, when they talk about, um, you know, you hear people in the, from the, you know, dog fighting terminology use the word gameness or game dog. And what they're really looking for in the breeding standard is they would look for a dog that would just never quit again, like whatever it is that drives them to do this, whether it be like, um, you know, a, a fight response, like an emotional response to like, you know, fight or flight and we choose fight, um, or it be that, you know like I said, that predatory aggression that overrides all self-preservation. Like they're looking, essentially looking for a dog that would never quit. They would even, you know, back in the day when they were doing these kind of things, they would even, if they had a dog that was losing and they were going to call the fight, they would do what was called a courtesy scratch where they would take the winning dog and they would hold it on one end of the pit and they would give the, you know, dog that was obviously losing probably close to death um a chance to make a ceremonious advance across the pit to approach that other dog one last time they would grab him before it was too late and even if that dog lost in some circles that would still be revered as a dog they could breed because again that dog had no quit so that's really like um that's what they were looking for um so if we go back to you know the first you know handfuls of decades of generations that were being bred with that intended purpose like that was kind of the standard so just again that like tenacity that rides all self-preservation um, yeah you know how the dog bit okay so then how is that different to if you were to breed a malinois to or like i mean you probably do to Quite not quit insane. and have yeah, like, and motivation it really is it's just like where we it's it's where human beings had put it you know like they're so similar in that regard to me um and it's it's kind of sad you know what i mean it's like it's almost like we had it's almost like we had two two kids at the orphanage and we took one and did all kinds of wonderful things with them and then we took the other and did all kinds of terrible things with them because it's like so many of the qualities are the same you know like that same, you know, tenacity that overrides self-preservation, which makes Malinois good for police and military and things like that. Um, the same kind of qualities that the, the pit bull possesses, but it just got, you know, through human influence, it was brought about and directed into uh, something that was bad. Um, so that's kind of like the sad, the sad thing with that breed, you know? Yeah. And and if you think about, like you said, right, we, we, we're really celebrating German Shepherds and, mm -hmm. and Malinois and their capacity to serve. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a very different view of bully breeds and pits. But at the same time, I think one of the bigger differences also is that on average, now that Hedge has shifted a little bit due to social media and certain movies coming out glorifying 
ownership of a Malinois, but mm-hmm. on average, it is accepted to say a Malinois is not necessarily a good dog as first time dog owner or a good yeah. pet dog. That's not the, we don't think about this for a pit. Should we think about this for a pit too? Is it not a good first time dog owner dog? Is it not a good pet dog? So yes and no. So and that's where it gets so tricky with again like the the dilution of the of the gene pool nowadays because there are some that are like they don't they don't have that drive to engage in that sort of activity or or maybe it's deeply 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 buried in there and we're not going to see it come out. And um they make yeah. awesome pet dogs, you know what I mean? Like I've met I've met a lot of uh a lot of pit bulls that just made really, really terrific pet dogs for people. Um, I think, I think whether or not it's a good first dog or whether or not it's a good pet dog, I I just think education is imperative. I think education on the end of whoever is, you know, adopting the dog or buying the dog, but then also education, um, to the rescues and to the shelters and things like that. Um, play a super big role you know people need more education we need better screening um things like that um because again yeah they i mean they can be like really really great dogs um it's what my kids were raised around i still ask them to this day we we haven't had pit bulls in a long time but i'll always ask them what their favorite dog is and that's what they always say you know oh that's cute (laughs) um so yeah so i mean they they're they can be terrific terrific pets it's just uh people need to understand and kind of dig into the ugly history to kind of understand a bit and to your point with like the mouths popping up in movies and stuff now um this is what popular culture does to stuff and that and that was such a thing with the pit bull too as you would see it kind of like glorified as this kind of gangster dog and, and stuff like that and um you know that kind of got a lot of people who didn't have the best intentions um interested in the breed and that did a lot of uh damage to the breed um so it's it's we're starting to see that same thing with uh with Malinois as well, you know, like um either people who are seeing them glorified through movies or news stories who who shouldn't really have them. And then also too, like I'm starting to see more and more you know, you know, when I talk to police and stuff like that, we're starting to see more and more kind of like underworld people starting to understand that the Malinois is a better choice than the pit bull for like you know, being a, a, a protector of their enterprise and, and things mm-hmm. like that. So starting to see Malinois pop up in those contexts um, more and more than we used to. So it's like, it's interesting how society kind of starts to influence. Um, what ends up. So in that, in the same token, are we on the way of creating a misunderstood Malinois? <laughs> like 10 years from now, maybe it's popping up more and more in, in normal homes as... Yeah. The yeah, new yeah, golden I, retriever. Yeah, and I just I think people just don't know they don't understand the breed. They don't research the breed ahead of time. They don't know what they're getting into. I've had countless, you know, pet Malinois people. I mean, they're all our pets, but like, you know, people who really should just have like a golden retriever, um, but now have a Malinois coming here, talking to me about medicating their dog and things like that. Where it's just like this is just a normal student doing Malinois stuff. Like mm-hmm. we need to, you know, like let's put that energy somewhere. And I think people don't really understand what they signed up for. I, you know, it gets, it gets painted as such a a difficult dog to own. Um, but that's really just contingent on your investment. Like, so to me, I, and it doesn't even come so, so much from being knowledgeable about dogs, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit, but you know, they're actually the easiest dog to train. You know, it's like any dog that has something that is that important to them, (laughs) <laughs> with that level of intelligence but it's a time commitment and it's an investment you know what i mean so like a lot of people that's too much it's not what they signed up for you know like i say all the time it's like um it's just kind of like the this concept in america so you know i got a house so we went out and got a dog you know that's just like the that's the program that's that's what we do you know um for the longest time i had this like really aggressive thing in my uh in my bio when people would come to work with me or, you know, see most trainers who like have a little write up on themselves or like what behaviors the dog is going to learn when they come to train. And I had gotten so fed up with it that I just had this aggressive thing where it was like, you took an animal into your house, you took on a debt 
And until you make good on that debt, we're not asking this dog to do anything. <laughs> it was rather aggressive because I was just like so fed up. Yeah. From seeing it. And like the Malinois is just like the ultimate example. Like to me, they're the ultimate example of everything, you know, just like how a dog works. Um, but they are the ultimate example of like people needing to be conscious of what they signed up for and what they are committing to. So is there, let's stick with the Malinois for a little bit, but is there, let's say a first time dog owner, right? But really committed mm -hmm. and investing time and the money it takes and potentially has the space. Mm -hmm. Is it then, would you say with a certain level of commitment, everyone can handle a Malinois? With the right commitment and if you have a plan. So like I would tell somebody, and especially too, it's like if somebody if somebody wants to get into something like protection sports and maybe they get interested in that and they have this, this like uh, notion of like, well, maybe I'll just get like a, you know, like a, a show line dog or like kind of a medium drive dog to kind of test the waters. It's like, you're going to regret doing that. You're going to get all the way in and you're going to be like, well, this kind of, this isn't as fun. <laughs> so I tell people if, if you're genuinely interested in that, um, have a plan. Like, Talk to some trainers, go visit a sport club, get familiar with the dogs, talk to some people that have them, talk to some people that live with them, um, understand what you're getting into. It, it, if all of those things are accounted for, yeah, I mean, that could be somebody's, that could be somebody's first dog, you know? Um, is it the best first pet dog for somebody who knows nothing and has no support system? No. But again, if somebody has like a really genuine interest, they have resources, they can, um, you know, get with a trainer, get with a club, talk to some people, then, then, then yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's doable. I think maybe in, 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 in the context, um, one thing that, you know, some people might say, well, whether this is a melon or, or generally I want to go into agility with my colleague or I want to do whatever it is as this is my plan. Um, I think something that trips people up to is they get a dog and maybe the, the parents look great and there's a pedigree and all that. And yet the temperament just doesn't fit the bill. Mm -hmm. And turns out the dog is not what they expected. Maybe too nervous, maybe too nervy, maybe even ag like aggressive as in um, too, too reactive and too shy and can't handle this. And then pivoting from that plan can be really, really, really hard because you had this plan yes. and now you don't know what to do with this dog. And the lifestyle will look very, very different. Mm -hmm. And yet you have this dog for 10 plus years now. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do we navigate, how do we navigate this? Because you probably ran through this as well, yeah. that you get a dog and you realize that this is not for, this is not the right path. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, like people make mistakes and, and sadly dogs occasionally have to be rehomed. And it's like, you know, as, as trainers and as somebody who advises people on what dog to get and how to bring up a dog, that's something that, you know, I always try to uh, prevent from happening. And again, this is where just like, understanding and good training and getting with a good trainer is just so it's so important um because again like i i see this with the malinois all the time it's like we'll see sport trainers who have one method they have one way and they have one way that they know how to do things and there's people who are like these revolving doors of and this is a little different than the, than the pet conversation but i see it in sport people where they are constantly returning six month old puppies to the breeder because it's not exactly what they wanted or it doesn't fit the exact way that they know how to train. Um, so to me, it's, it's important, just like, good training is important, getting around somebody who really understands, um, you know, how dogs work and how to work with different dogs and how to troubleshoot and how to problem solve. You know, if somebody's looking at, at getting a dog, yeah, I mean, like having an understanding of genetics, proven genetics, talking to a good breeder, um, understanding and knowing about the dogs in the first couple of generations of the pedigree like it's not always a guarantee it's your safest it's your safest bet um but outside of that just having having a good support system i mean sadly sadly rehomes happen um you know i i, I have seen other people who when the plans change they say hey i still love the dog we're going to give them a good life they're going to stay with me so like i applaud that um but yeah i mean really again just preparation and research and things like that can hopefully you know give us the best odds in, in preventing that but um yeah it, it definitely happens sometimes so when when let's go to for example rehoming or adopting a dog right not mm -hmm. just getting from a breeder not just sport dog, not, whatever it is obviously there are a lot of males and in, in shelters now too let's say yeah. you want to go down that route but the dog is probably in the shelter 
due to some behavior issues. Now, if we talk about rehabbing, and this is a very complex topic mm-hmm. and really depends on, on, on the dog, but you go in and maybe the dog has a very different personality in the shelter and you feel like really hopeful and ready and you want to do good. In terms of rehabbing, two questions here that, that probably tie together. What role does obedience play in rehabbing a dog? And, you know, if you had to boil it down to just a few activities, what would be something that is the most important thing that may have, because it was lacking or missing, may have led to behavior issues, maybe have led to a disconnect between the handler and the dog, maybe have led, has led to the manifestation of bad behaviors. And now you're adopting this dog and you want to undo things. Mm-hmm. If you had to rehab 10 dogs, is there something, regardless of the dog, is there something that you would do with all of them? So there's a, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> so there's a couple Sorry. of, uh, <laughs> no, it's good. There's a couple of different, um, a couple of different things I'll look at and a couple of different things like boxes I'll try to check. So um, two, two very good trainers, um, a friend of mine, Jay Jack and his, partner chad mack and they used to have a podcast together called dog training conversations um they they kind of popularized this kind of like uh concept of the layered stress model um it's kind of like a trigger stacking thing but like at the macro at the macro level so that's really um a great example of the the kind of the lens that i like to look at dogs through um when i first meet them and then first kind of trying to diagnose what's going on with any kind of potential problem so like the first layer in that in that scenario is kind of like looking at you know the dog's you know health and well-being like is all that accounted for the next one up is the uh I'm pulling it up right now i should know it off the top of my head but like the lifestyle so like does the dog live like a fulfilling and biologically appropriate lifestyle to me that's huge dogs are yeah they're domesticated but like look at them like they still exist in in, in quite a primitive way so you know, I, I joke with people all the time how many behavior cases I've fixed by teaching dogs to play fetch and giving them access to raw bones. You know, like so the raw biologically bones. appropriate yeah, so the, the biologically appropriate lifestyle is huge. Um, you know, creating clarity with uh, you know, understanding like um the dynamic between dog and human, um creating a language. So it's, it's a huge thing. I mean, it's like we have a species disconnect between us and the dog. So if we can right. start to establish a language i tell people all the time it's like if we dropped you know somebody off in a in a country um far away from where they live and they didn't speak the language there's to be instant panic you know what i mean there's no way of communication so like establishing you know clarity and, and two-way communication with the dog is, is is huge um the minute they have answers to your questions they start to feel a lot better you know what i mean and that also kind of puts us in kind of a a role where we're able to give directives and take decision making pressure off of the dog and, and things like that. So those are those are kind of the things that that I look at squaring away first. You know, just like baseline health, um, biologically appropriate lifestyle, and then clarity and communication. And then um in actually dissecting a, a, a problem that's occurring, you know, we try to get into looking at, you know, how much of its nature, how much of it is nurture, and then how much of it is revolves around like reinforcement history. So that's another big part of, of the, the kind of stuff that I'm looking at when I when I meet dogs like that. Reinforcement history is huge. We have a dog that, uh, you know, they have a couple of bites under their belt and that has created space for them when they needed space. Um, that reinforcement history is something that, that needs to be addressed along with rewiring how they feel about whatever the trigger is. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say, going back to one of the first steps, right, um, appropriate for the dog in terms of the health and the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Now, I think this is very hard for a lot of people because we have literally been anchored to a certain picture of what a dog wants and needs. Mm-hmm. And that is being um, uh, what's the right, exacerbated by yeah. when you go to a pet smart and you see the yeah. squeaky toys and you see potentially you know these nylon bones and whatnot and that might give you the illusion it's like my dog has these problems but has everything he or she needs so the problem that i see is not 
obviously one is yes some people just need to you know educate themselves a little bit more and invest some time but even if you do you still might be led down the wrong path so how do we overcome this hurdle of um you know what what we think a dog needs and what a dog actually needs and unfortunately you know your first step always is going to be the internet free yep. information which is obviously great but again i think i haven't really seen a really good source that you know might just help might might sound a little bit um rude as in like your dog doesn't need all these little toys but give it a raw bone like you said yeah or just play and let the dog run so how do we overcome that because i do think that there is there's a lot of misconception of like what the dog really is especially if they look cute but they're yeah. still a dog right yeah and, and this is like this is like the problem um with dog training in, in general is like um and, and and you know from your background in in science like people will boil it down to like like you and i had talked about this before when people say science-based dog training it's like well what scientific approach are we talking about you know what i mean or what scientific discipline are we acknowledging when we talk about dog training it's the same you know like we have a lot of dog trainers who are just focused on behavior um how do i make a dog do x y or z i think if there was more trainers who were educated on and put priority on these you know this biologically appropriate lifestyle piece and could educate people on what that is um that makes such a giant difference and and i tell people and it's like what i was talking about when i raise dogs and i and i just really try to you know just focus on play for the first however long of their life it's um you know i had a i had like a meme about this a couple of years ago that's like when you become the window through which they access these like biological imperatives like then like that's just it like you know you always have people that's like a classic thing that pet clients will say is like well I, he just doesn't listen <laughs> it's like, a he doesn't understand who you're saying but b if you were the person who fulfilled all those needs you would have a much better leg to stand on so to me that stuff comes down to like you know and if we get into some of the you know ethology stuff like being a functional predator is such a big part of who a dog is so how we kind of set up play in that manner how we set up exploration of the environment in that manner yeah i mean like like i said the raw bones thing it's like you know when a dog you know is bored or anxious or stressed like they'll revert to like some kind of you know untapped biological biologically biological imperative behavior that is not being utilized because you know we don't give them access to or they don't need to do that anymore so as they take it out on your furniture or they take it out mm -hmm. on your shoes or something like that so i mean like that's a huge like i said it's like play and fetch and chewing bones and then going going off leash in the woods you know that was a cool um that was a cool thing i remember uh ivan had said a while ago um that i always really loved that i'm sure he won't mind me sharing but like you know people were talking about getting ready for competition and everybody has this kind of thing of like, okay, well, you know, a couple of weeks before competition, I start dialing back my rewards and maybe I cut training a bit and then I swim the dog a couple of times instead and blah, 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 blah. And they have like this, like a taper for like a professional athlete. Like they have mm -hmm. this program mm -hmm. and then somebody, Ivan kind of weighed in on what he does. And he just said, like, I go to the woods with them with no leash and collar so that I can <laughs> be like in their space with them. You know, yeah. it's like such a beautiful thing to me. It's like, I'm not saying I'm not advocating that everybody go take your dog off leash with no collar. <laughs> it's no. like if, if we can like let them be a dog and connect with them in the in the world that they are built to live in, you know, because we're asking a lot to have them live in our world, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, finding ways to satisfy that stuff is super important for the well-being of any dog. And if, if we can, you know, move the needle as far as, you know, helping trainers understand that better. Dog training is the laces. Um, there's some great schools. There's people who simply watch a couple of YouTube videos and then they make a business card. Um, you know, there's people who follow social media influencers who are the wrong ones, you know? So it's like, if we can get people a, a better understanding of this stuff and get trainers, uh, better methods of understanding and delivering this information, I, I think dogs will benefit quite a bit. Um, yeah. you know, and, and again, like, I'm for sure not the end all be all of any kind of a teacher, but uh, I've had the good fortune of um, getting to work with some of the best, best people in the industry 
Um, fortunate enough to call a lot of them friends. Um, so I've learned a lot of really cool things and I, I'm really excited about any opportunity I get to spread that information um, to help trainers. But then at the end of the day to just, you know, make better lives for dogs too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you were talking, um, I just had this, well, I thought, I thought about this a lot before, but it just got remembered that I, that I <laughs> tend to have this thought, not so much maybe for sport dogs, but generally dogs and dog training and pet dogs. If you think about it, it's very interesting when you ask someone, well, what do you want your dog to do, right? And almost always, it is what they want to do with the dog, which almost always requires the dog to not do something. Yeah. So we usually do dog training. So my dog doesn't pull on the leash. My dog can be still in the coffee shop. My dog doesn't bark out of the window. My dog is fine in the car. My dog recalls and doesn't chase something. So we kind of set up this environment for dogs. And as soon as they're being born and adopted and go home, they have this list of all the things they're not supposed to do because the owners want to share time with their dog, which is obviously the right motivation, right? But here's the question. Then, then the next step is now we're setting up discussions around, okay, here's all the lists we don't want on our dogs to do. Now we start fighting over what is the right methodology, methodology, methodology to teach them not to bark, not to pull on the leash, right? And then we drizzle down into pure balanced, pure balanced, oh my God, balanced versus pure positive. Yeah. What if we completely were to shift the perspective instead of saying, all these things you don't, you, you do dog training so your dog doesn't do all these things and completely shift. Here's a dog training so your dog really can do all these things and everything in we layer in later in terms of you have much, like you said, much better communication to tell your dog this is not appropriate. Yeah. Does A, do you see, agree with kind of this, you know, divide of like what we actually think we're doing dog training for and would then actually as a consequence fall? This whole discussion of again balanced and pure positive would this maybe fall apart because there is no ground for this anymore? It's the view shifting perspective and then what really matters. Yeah, yeah. And 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 to me that that's like like those those you know, like those labels like bother me. Um I don't really know like I don't really know if there is really such a thing as purely positive. I mean, it's like kind of impossible. And then the, you know, a lot of like balanced trainer to me is like, it's just like too, too broad. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm a balanced trainer. And it's like, yeah, I, I yank the dog around with a prong collar, but I give him some food after. So it's okay. You know, like I see a lot of that too. Like I, I, I think that like, if we could have a giant shift kind of like to what I call like thoughtful dog training, where it's like, we take into consideration all of the things that you and I are talking about. Um, you know, as far as like the, the biologically appropriate lifestyle and all that stuff prior to deciding what the dog can't do. And if those are the first things that we look at, um, it just goes such a, such a long way to having a, a more well-adjusted dog. And then, you know, at the end of the day too, with all of that stuff, you know, there, there are instances where, and I don't want to get anything too controversial, but there are instances where like, we, we absolutely have to tell a dog like, no, you can't do that. You know? Um, especially, like I said, with some of these cases where there's like reinforcement history involved, where like a certain bad behavior has been seen as an advantage for that dog in the past. And to me, like our buy-in to even be able to a approach that conversation with the dog is being the source of satisfying all of these other things ahead of time. You know what I mean? It's like, I tell mm -hmm. people, I give the example with kids. I say, it's like, we have a teenage kid who's like been getting in some trouble and like, who needs to have like a stern talking to like, who who's going to come, where's that going to come from? Um, you know, it'd be better heard from like a juvenile probation officer or that kid's baseball coach or like that kid's art teacher or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, so I think really like, that's just such a way in with, with dogs. And again, like we can, if, if we, handle all of that preemptively and give a dog access to that kind of lifestyle and foster that kind of communication, we preemptively get rid of a lot of problems um, before they occur. But when we do have to address problems, that gives us like a much better leg to stand on. And I, and I think it's just really, like I had said, it's, it's a two part thing of getting, getting trainers and dog professionals to, uh, you know, adopt and understand these ideas a little bit better. 
and then selling them to the public. And it, it's hard. We have to create like a, a shift in the public about getting people generally more excited about dogs. Because again, like we said, like there's a list of all the things that the dog can't do. And there's some franchises out there that specialize in, in suppression. You know what I mean? Like it, it is what it is. You know what I mean? They come in, the dog's doing all the things that the dog does because they're a dog and we've given them no outlet to be a dog. And then franchise training business comes in, nukes the dog into oblivion. Person who doesn't know what they're looking at sees suppressed dog and goes, look how good he is now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like It's just the yeah. whole thing is, it's kind of sad. So you know, it's my hope that with more education, more talks like this, um, that we can, you know, help shift that a little bit. Yeah. In that, in, in, in that context, maybe in terms of let the dog be a dog and circling back to our initial conversation about dog bites, let's mm -hmm. talk about biting okay. in the context of uh, fight, in the context of tug of war yeah. and um, or play in general, right? Mm -hmm. So dog bites, everyone is like, uh oh, red yeah. flag, my dog can never bite, right? And yeah. almost as a consequence for very powerful dogs, we hesitate or we, we shy away from really getting into a good play mm -hmm. because out of fear that it might, and it, it can happen, right? Uh, escalate to a point where there is the redirection and potentially a hand gets bitten, right? Not mm -hmm. to say that even like, I mean, I have gotten bitten so many times by Anya. Probably my fault That's because good, my targeting yeah. is just yeah. not yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> or her targeting is great, but my my position, whatever. Um, but there's an hit. This is one thing that for me is like the neurobiology of bites. And I don't think a lot of research has been done, but it is very, very interesting because some dogs, they just want to bite Malinor, for example, right? So going back to this this breed. And um, I remember talking to Michael Ellis about this and he uh, mentioned a situation where he saw a dog bite and bite sleep or whatever. And you could literally see something changing in the dog's face and eyes as if this dog is on drugs. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. Clearly something happens there, which is yeah. incredibly rewarding. Right. And what is your your take on like the the role of tugging as a pet dog as a sports dog doesn't really matter right depending on if the dog wants it and can we kind of take that that game can we master that game and can we shift how we see a dog bite instead of saying bites all bites are always bad never bite never always you know the bite inhibition thing like you've got yeah, to teach yeah. your dog from the very beginning oh. bite <laughs> inhibition and rather than that, just saying, this is what you can buy. The same with the raw bone and really chewing on it, right? So yeah. let's talk about dog bites. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that like we can uh, approach play. And, and again, like one of the ways that, that I like to think about it is a, a lot of play mimics sort of like certain parts of the, the predatory motor sequence. And we see certain dog breeds that were, you know, selected for either an emphasis on or an absence of certain parts of that sequence. And that kind of influences a lot of the ways that they, that they play. You know, when, when we talk about, you know, that like, you know, grab, bite, kill, bite, possess kind of thing, you know, again, it's like something that the dog is programmed to do, you know, um, there are certain dogs that like, are so heavily selected for that, whether it be for their working discipline or, or, or whatever reason, that we really like need a, a place to put that. And, and again, that's just, it's a huge part of their function. So when we start talking about like this bite inhibition stuff, like it, it's just, I, I, to me, that's nonsense. Um, <laughs> You know, like the idea, like we'd hear this all the time and like the, the myths that used to be around years ago were hilarious. It's like, don't play tug. It'll make your dog mean. Or if you play, my favorite one is if you play tug, you can never let them win. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. Think, mm -hmm. And they think that they can dominate you and stuff like that. It's like, no, like I, I think and, and this kind of, you know, like I'll give a nod to uh, to Ivan for this one. And, um, you know, like I graduated his, his TWC program. I was one of the first first groups to go through it is like he makes a really clear delineation between um, what's a game and what's an activity. So it's like when we start to set tug up like an actual game, a game has an objective and a game has rules, you know? And that, to me, that's like a perfect venue to start introducing rules and, and cooperation. And then again, like if something happens where, you know, the dog kind of 
you know, gets, gets fresh and doesn't, you know, doesn't respect the timeout in the game and wants to like give a dirty bite or something like that. We now have a venue to address that where the dog is already feeling good, where we're already being cooperative, right? So it's just, it, like the whole thing just, it, it works synergistically. It's all, it, it's, it's perfect. You know, like we have a great leg to stand on, tell the dog, no, you can't do that. If they get stressed by us telling them that, we have this game where we can bring them back up again. And again, to rules and cooperation. So like, I, I, you know, I'm not joking when I tell people ask me like, you know, like what's one of the ways that you deal with dogs that do resource guarding and stuff like that teach them to play tug you know like teach them to understand a cooperative game where we have trust and they mm -hmm. understand that i'm not always trying to take them take something mm -hmm. from them and that we can cooperate so to me it's like it's one of the most valuable things we can teach. and not every dog likes to play it like most you know like most every dog will still chase something the tug thing is is, is a little bit trickier with dogs that are not super comfortable with dogs that don't have trust yet, when dogs that have like uh, more of a defensive edge, sometimes you have to be like really careful of how we um, approach that game. But I, I think it's just like, it's a great, it's just such a valuable game um, for the dog to just exercise that, you know, that innate behavior that they need to do, but then also set it up in a way that we have rules and cooperation and build trust mm -hmm. and all of that at the same time. It's, it's like, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and especially with dogs that like to bite, especially with pit bull, pit bulls, malinois, dogs like that. It's um it's it's perfect. Yeah. I think as you said, um not every dog likes to to play tug. And you mentioned fetch as well. Mm -hmm. Uh I like to dig just a little bit deeper into this because um people might now just have these two categories in mind. Tug and fetch and then say my dog doesn't like either but it's not actually about the fetch or the tug but how you in that moment actually cooperate or compete right yeah. and what i mean by that is um the video you showed me with hilda right how you play with her you literally just she just stands there and you kind of try to grab the tug and she shakes and that's It seems stationary, but there's actually a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then for others, like like Anya, for my dog, when the tugging itself, she's not so much into it, but she loves when she wins and then punches it back into you. And the more distance she has, the better because she has, you know, all this movement and all that. Like you when you caught your dog at the beach, that was really cute. Yeah. But anyways, so let's just go get it. Like regardless of we label it fetch or tug, what kind of different play styles in terms of what dogs might find rewarding have you observed yeah and, and that's where like um having like having an eye for that is or being uh like conscious of uh, paying attention and, and looking for what the dog finds reinforcing is, is super important um too many people like in my opinion they they treat play like they're teaching a behavior and the uh this is like no thanks to you know, Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that. You know, everybody who wants the dog that like jumps and pushes the toy into them. And we see it all. I've seen it at seminars where people like, come on, come on. The dog jumps and then pushes the toy and then they click and pay with a piece of food. And it's like, oh my God, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> we're missing the yeah. boat here. You know, like all three of the dogs that I have here right now, they all play entirely different. You know, like my dog Iris was the one in the video where I'm trying to take it. Um, oh, okay, okay. That's her, that's her thing. And like, she'll stand there and she's like, you saw the video, she's wagging her tail and her ears are up and she's like, come on, try, come on. And all I do is touch it. And she goes, ha, you can't have it. <laughs> and then he'll be the dog that runs and jumps into me with the ball. And then my older male dog, I joke with people. It looks like police dog or personal protection bite work. Like I'm on my, the ground and he's in a headlock and I have my leg over him. And we're like, <laughs> like it's like a, it's like a fight. Uh, pick him up off the ground like he, like that's what he likes you know what i mean yeah. it, it's all different um so being able to like let the dog dictate have an eye for that like let them do what feels good to them um as far as like the fetch versus tug thing you know there's like again there's some dogs who like in the beginning maybe not always but maybe in the beginning the tug thing is like way too personal like we're hit we're hitting like way way too close to personal space or, or too much of a boundary um To me, when I have dogs that have aggression problems or fear problems or, or things like that, um, playing fetch, chasing a ball is like usually the first thing that I like to do. I, I, I loathe approaching dogs like that with food. I think, um, I mean, 
you know, there's exceptions and rules. I mean, there's times where that might be the most appropriate choice, but like, you know, and you know, too, I mean, it's like a whole different part of the brain. It's like getting a dog to, you know, a dog that's either like, for whatever reason they're showing aggression or whatever reason they're showing fear and getting them to try to feel comfortable enough. Like now you take from my hand, you know what I mean? It's like, it's problematic. You know, when we can get the dog to chase a ball, like we're making space with us, we're fostering an interaction. And then in most cases, we're tapping into some kind of like prey drive. You know, we know when dogs run, they relieve stress. Um, that prey drive piece. It's like, I, I joke with people. I go, like, have you ever seen a, you know, a cheetah chasing a gazelle and they look scared, you know, I mean? like, mm -hmm. you know they feel good mm -hmm. when they're doing that. So that's like, if I'm just meeting a dog or if I'm working through it, you know, a dog that has, I remember I had a German shepherd that came a couple of years ago and, and they had been to two trainers and one trainer was like, oh, I'm just going to sit here on the floor until he approaches me for food. And this dog had bit like two or three people, like pretty bad. And the one trainer was like, I'm just going to sit on the floor and wait till the dog feels comfortable enough to approach for food. And yeah, it's like that dog's learning to stick its hand into a bear trap. It's daring itself to get closer and closer. And then they had seen another trainer who was like the complete opposite of like, we need to roll this dog on its side and like do the alpha dominant, thing, like all this nonsense. And neither of those trainers worked. I remember I showed up on day one and the dog was like barking at the other side of a gate. You know what I mean? And I took out a tennis ball and bounced it off the ground and the dog just, and I was like, well, you're mine, you're mine, <laughs> you're like mine now. you know? Um, yeah. So like so much of it is like the absence of being able to engage in those kind of activities. But again, when we can connect over that, that's like, oh my God, there's this thing that's so important to me and you made that happen. It's like, we bank so much good faith there. Yeah. Yeah. I, what do you hear all the time too? And, and you know, that. I don't blame people for doing it because it's very hard not to fall into that trap uh, because social media and the internet is full with that. This classic, you know, stranger danger and um, you either throw food fine or then just, you know, the dog is freaking out, but you yeah. keep stuffing food in that stock. And I say it all the time. It's you can be fearful and eat at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, Dogs most likely or animals most likely will take the food because we train them from really on. This he has all the treats, right? Yep. And they will take the food and then they will bite you. Yep. And people seem very, very surprised by this. Like, but it took the food. I thought we were on good terms. And that's where I usually really hone into, you know, understanding the behavior from what really happens in the brains. That that they don't they can overlap and there is really no reason for a dog to not be skeptical just because you gave a piece of food mm -hmm. and understanding what makes some. And the funny thing is we can, we can, we can draw parallels to humans and kids, but somehow we keep forgetting doing it in certain times because especially with kids that, and you see this, um, you can read up on, on like human psychology and, and trauma and PTSD with kids before the kids opens up to really talk about what was traumatizing, you make that kid play with that person mm -hmm. games. They mm -hmm. have to connect first. They play, um, the therapist, you know, brings all the coloring and whatnot. So the kid is in a completely different mind, mind space. Yeah. And then we'll start talking and now the dogs don't talk, but they at least will play and have like a normal conversation in their ways with you. And, and this is probably like a, 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 a statement that's much better, you know, coming from somebody like you with a professional background than me, but like in all the reading I've done and everything like that, it's like the, uh, you know, the endogenous opioids that are present when we play, they make us feel more safe and flexible and, and yeah. things like that in those situations. You know, a great example, uh, uh, again, going back to my time spent with, with Ivan, I remember him saying like, you know, giving the human example of like, uh, we were like all in his, in his training building in his classroom. And I remember him saying like, if this was your first day here and you were nervous and I came in and I did this whole thing where I'm not going to give you eye contact. So I just walk like this and I came over to your desk and I just put down a piece of pizza and then I slowly back away. He's like, what are you, what are you going to think? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, what if I came in and said in, inside and said, Hey, do you want to go outside and throw a ball around for a little while? Like you're feeling a lot better, you know? Yeah. Um, and to me, the, like, um, um, you know, the, the play stuff too, again, like a, a scared dog will eat. Um, the play stuff for me is like so much more of a better gauge of openness and like yeah. 
you know, and it, and it can promote that, that feeling as well. Yeah. You know, um, they reminded me before I went all, uh, heavy on dogs, I, um, consider myself a cat person. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I sure. did was, <laughs> <or Malinois. laughs> yeah. yeah, don't, yeah, that was, that was yeah. not smart and still not smart. <laughs> <I'm> still <laughs> working through it, <laughs> yeah. meaning complete separation. <laughs> yeah. That's my management. Anyways. Um, so I was digging into like, you know, what can you do with cats? And, and my, my research brain was still kicking in, but, um, something that you do with all cats that are shy and that you know hiding and, um, you want them to come out. You don't throw food either because cats are more likely not to take it. Mm -hmm. You play. Yeah. And it's the same thing there. What you say with cats is that, I mean, they kick into their prey drive really quickly with like these, these certain toys and cats tend, some cats tend to be very shy in open areas because it's, you know, they obviously cats are predators and preys at the same time. So you play and they feel more comfortable. And that's the only thing you can do because you can train dogs. You can say, sit and click and then give a treat, right? So you have to default to something that works and it's much more simple. And kind of because we think, you know, dogs can learn and they're intelligent and obedience, we always default to. Let's teach own behavior and obedience to not be fearful rather than, you know, tapping into yeah. what really makes them not fearful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, again, if we can get like, if we can get the training community as a whole more on board with that, with that thought process, then, then we would do a lot of good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have one last question for you. Sure. If you could put out one big message that everyone can internalize, maybe something for everyone who has a dog, who wants a dog, I think I mentioned it before. I feel like in America, everyone at some point in their life will think about getting a dog because that's just what you do. Um, what what would that be? What would you want everyone to think about when it comes to dogs? I I would hope that everybody could slow down and get interested in dogs. Actually, interested in in, in dogs and who they really are. I think it's you know they're so so closely tied to our our culture um through all the years that they've been domesticated and it's such an, an important part of our our household and, and things like that that i think if you know if people can really just like slow down and remember why that is and um all the awesome things that they bring to the table all the awesome things that they're capable of all the things that they're capable of learning how how cool it is to see the the beautiful things that they are built to do um I think if people can like slow down, you know, find time to give that, we'll be quite a bit happier as well. I, mm -hmm. I used to kind of tell people there's like a saying, like in the fitness world, there's like days you don't feel like going to the gym, but you force yourself. And when you're done, you're happy you went. You know what I mean? And I can't ever think of a time where I was in like a bad mood and I went out and played with my dog and that didn't at least give temporary relief, but more than likely gave me relief afterwards as well. You know what I mean? It's yeah. such, such a, such a great, such a great animal so i would just tell people to just you know educate yourself on, on what it is that they need to do and slow down and enjoy them you know yeah yeah i agree with that what i try to to emphasize too is when you do the research is okay that it, it might be that's a hard, little bit yeah. too much to ask right yeah, but yeah, yeah. uh get interested get interested yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and yeah. stay interested not just yeah. now i'm done and i've picked my dog the yeah. breed that I want, but stay interested in what, how can I do better and what, yeah. what else? Because 99% of the time, there will be something else that you don't know yet and that you can find out. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a perfect way of ending. Thank you so much for coming. I really for enjoyed me. the conversation. Absolutely. We'll do that again. And um, yeah, go play with your dogs now. Um, that's the plan. You too. <laughs>